Thank you very much, Dean Mahoney, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for being here this afternoon, especially on Halloween. Uh, it is such a great honor to be appointed the Mortimer Kaplan Chair. Uh, Professor Kaplan's uh, generosity to this law school community is truly ubiquitous, uh, including this magnificent Kaplan Pavilion in which we sit uh, today. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank my wife Kay for being here and uh, my mother and her husband Jim for driving all the way from Michigan for this event. No pressure. Uh, and let me also take this opportunity <clears throat> to thank the law school community for welcoming my wife Kay, my son Will, and me to Charlottesville 17 years ago and the support you've given us uh, throughout our time here. Let me just see if I can get this out of my... You. Okay. Okay, the, the journey I invite you on today is entitled The Canary Blind Constitution Must Government Ignore Racial Inequality? And my talk raises two puzzles one medical and one legal. The medical or public health puzzle is what are the causes of racial disparities? in health, and what can be done to address those causes. The federal government and every state invests uh, enormous amounts of resources researching uh, this question, and the quote I have behind me is a statement of the guiding principle of the Center for Disease Control Office of Minority Health, uh, which is to uh, reduce race disparities in health to improve the health of the entire nation. Now, why the interest in health disparities, and in particular, I want to talk about racial disparities in infant mortality. Well, infant mortality, first of all, of course, is a tragedy. Any infant dying in its first year of life uh, is a tragedy, and 25,000 infants die in the United States alone every year. A second interest in infant mortality rates is that infant mortality serves as a signal regarding the overall health and well-being of a community. Policymakers, researchers, government agencies routinely look at infant mortality rates as a gauge for how well the population is doing in terms of economics, nutrition, the environment, government, uh, democracy or oppression, war tend to be reflected in infant mortality rates. And then also, the signal provided by infant mortality rates can serve as a guide to identifying underlying causes. And solving those causes or addressing those causes can be used to help everybody. And this is where the canary in the title of my talk uh, comes in. Uh, law professors Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres in their book, The Miner's Canary, use the metaphor of the coal miner's canary. For centuries, coal miners took canary birds into the mine. And because their respiratory systems are more sensitive than humans, when they, sh they would show distress when toxicity levels became uh, dangerous. So when the canary shows distress or dies, it's time to get out. And Guineer and Torres say we can analogize racial disparities to the canary in the mine. That racial disparities are a signal that there's some underlying cause that's systematically causing racial disparities, some social, economic, environmental cause, and that searching for the causes of the racial disparity can help to identify those causes for the benefit of everybody. So why do black infants in the United States die at two to three times the rate of white infants? And why has this ratio actually increased over the past 30 years, despite landmark advances in civil rights and advances in the quality and distribution of healthcare services? And if you control for socioeconomics, so for example, if you can compare middle-class black females to middle-class white females, the gap is actually larger. 
than when you compare overall black females to overall black or white females. It, the gap goes up as you proceed up the economic ladder. And in fact, black women with graduate degrees have higher rates of infant mortality than white women without a high school diploma. And researchers have struggled to understand and explain uh, racial disparities, and many factors have been looked into, such as things like income, uh, education levels, other socioeconomic factors, uh, access to health care, including prenatal care, utilization of health care, uh, best sleeping practices. Many of these factors have been identified as causes of infant mortality, and they have been used to bring infant mortality rates down, and they have been brought down significantly over the past 30 years. But despite addressing these underlying causes, the ratio of black to white has not gone down, and in fact, has gone up. So researchers have puzzled as to what explains the racial gap. So some have suggested perhaps it's biology. Uh, perhaps there are race-linked genes that explain uh, the racial gap that perhaps cause uh, poor birth outcomes in black women. But this explanation has also been discounted. Uh, some of the research has looked at first-generation African immigrants and compared their infant mortality rates with African-American immigrants and with white immigrants. And the thought was that if it's, if it's linked to race, then African immigrants would likely have even higher infant mortality rates because their racial stock is, in some sense, uh, more pure. But what they found is that African immigrants have infant mortality rates much more comparable to white American females, uh, and significantly better than uh, black American women who've been here for sub several generations. And in fact, those immigrant women, as you look at subsequent generations, the infant mortality rates go up. And this is true of Asian immigrants and Hispanic immigrants as well, that the first generation, this is controlling for socioeconomic status as well, the first generation have lower infant mortality rates than second and third generation. For white immigrants, it's the opposite. White mothers have, first generation immigrants, have higher rates of infant mortality than the second or third generation. So there seems to be something about living in America for women of color uh, that has detrimental effects on birth outcomes, uh, such as, for example, uh, premature birth or low birth weight. So the most recent hypothesis that has gained traction is stress. Not just the acute stress of pregnancy, but also chronic stress or the accumulation of stress over a lifetime, and that this stress, including from childhood, can have effects on birth outcomes. And the hypothesis is that black women are more likely to experience more stress than white women. And I'm primarily comparing black to white uh, as the extreme examples. So um, one of the features of life that may be causing stress is discrimination, uh, at least is hypothesized. Experiencing discrimination, the perception of discrimination, the fear of discrimination, and also socioeconomic factors like living in high crime neighborhoods, financial stress, uh, family dislocation, only with factors that don't show up when you just compare women when they're pregnant. So recall when you compare middle class black and white women, there's a significant gap. In fact, it's, it's approximately three to one. But the idea is middle class, professional, affluent black women are more likely to be first generation into the middle class. So they're more likely to have grown up poor and experienced the stress associated with that experience. So many recent programs have incorporated stress uh, as part of the effort to reduce infant mortality uh, for everybody. Uh, such as the immediate impacts of stress, such as hypertension, and also preconception effects uh, on stress, such as uh, uh, 
poor nutrition, financial stress, lack of childcare, lack of father involvement, providing counseling uh, for women uh, who may need it. And these are promising, but the jury is still out. And race disparities in infant mortality are still described as the persistent puzzle. Which leads me to the second puzzle, the legal puzzle. The legal puzzle is, does the Constitution permit the government to investigate and address the causes of racial disparities in health, in infant mortality? And by the Constitution, I want to clarify, I mean as interpreted by the Supreme Court. This project is uh, looking at Supreme Court interpretations, not to endorse those interpretations, but to take them seriously and examine their implications. So here are three potential responses to racial disparities in infant mortality, and let me suggest uh, their potential constitutional problems. One, provide stress care for black women to reduce the racial gap in infant mortality. Second, provide stress care for all women to reduce the racial gap in infant mortality. Third, provide stress care for all women to reduce infant mortality, period. So let me go through each, but my bottom line to guide you where I'm going is that the first is almost certainly unconstitutional. Number two is uncertain, but I will argue the logic of current constitutional law would probably hold it unconstitutional. The third, possibly, but I will argue that current law should uphold response number three. So to understand response number one's constitutional status, I need to explain the strict scrutiny test, which is what the Supreme Court applies to racial classifications. And strict scrutiny, by design, invalidates most laws unless they further some compelling governmental interest. They're to advance some very important government goal, and the racial classification is necessary to achieve that goal. And by racial classification, the court means a law that classifies people expressly by race, and then the result is that in administering the law, people are then treated differently on the basis of race. So the Civil War resulted in the Equal Protection Clause being added to the Constitution, but it was not applied with much rigor for 100 years. Segregation was upheld. And then by the mid to late 20th century, the Supreme Court started applying strict scrutiny to laws that classified by race. And the laws in question were laws that discriminated against African Americans. So the court applied this, and the result was every segregationist law was invalidated. For example, in Loving versus Virginia, 1967, the Supreme Court applied strict scrutiny to laws that prohibited interracial marriage. And the court said it failed the test. It's unconstitutional. It doesn't further compelling interest. Rather, it's designed to preserve white supremacy. What was uncertain at that time, in the late 1960s, was whether this strict scrutiny test would apply to racial classifications designed to benefit racial minorities. Such policies were unknown at the time. And both on and off the Supreme Court, the question was debated when affirmative action policies arose, race-based affirmative action policies that classify by race for the benefit of minorities. And those who would argue strict scrutiny should not apply to those kinds of policies argued for what's been called the anti-subordination theory of equal protection. This theory holds that the purpose of equal protection is to prevent a dominant, powerful majority from subordinating a politically weak minority. And laws that disadvantaged African Americans uh, violated this anti-subordination principle, and so they were subject to strict scrutiny and struck down. But, they argued, laws that 
are designed to benefit racial minorities are different. Uh, we shouldn't be so skeptical of their validity because here the dominant majority is disadvantaging itself. And so we can take a more lenient hand, we being the, the court, because we can presume that there's probably a legitimate reason for the discrimination when the majority discriminates, in a sense, against itself in favor of the minority, which is what race-based affirmative action does. In contrast to the anti-subordination theory is the anti-classification theory. And the anti-classification theory holds that the purpose of equal protection is to prohibit the government from classifying people by race. It presumes colorblindness on the part of the government, the idea being that Race is irrelevant. It doesn't determine one's intelligence or moral character. So government generally should have no business classifying people by race. So we should be suspicious when the government is classifying people by race, regardless of which race is being benefited or burdened, because it's irrelevant regardless of which race. So that policy, that principle, was ultimately adopted by the Supreme Court in 1989 after over a decade of uh, disagreement on the Supreme Court, a majority coalesced around the anti-classification approach and now holds, per the second quotation I have, that all racial classifications are to re be reviewed under strict scrutiny, even those that benefit a racial minority. So applying that to response number one, this is a form of race-based affirmative action in the sense that it's a racial classification designed to benefit a racial minority. It classifies women by race, black women, and then provides stress care only to those women to reduce racial, uh, the racial gap in infant mortality. So this would be subject to strict scrutiny, and that fact alone means it's probably going to be unconstitutional. But perhaps there are two ways to uphold it under strict scrutiny. First, isn't reducing infant mortality a compelling governmental interest? Surely it is. But, the court would likely hold, the use of race is not necessary to reduce infant mortality. To the contrary, by limiting the benefit to black women, you're not helping white women who might also benefit from stress care or some other benefit to reduce infant mortality. So the racial classification is not necessary. It fails the strict scrutiny test. Another potential justification would be, well, what about making up for the effects of historic racial discrimination? So presumably, racial disparities in society, including in infant mortality, reflect at least to a substantial degree the systematic discrimination against African Americans throughout our history. And so the only way to remedy those uh, consequences is to now favor allocating benefits to African Americans in order to uh, undo or remedy the effects of discrimination. And that's a common understanding of one of the purposes of affirmative action. The Supreme Court has acknowledged the legitimacy of, and in fact, the compelling nature of trying to remedy discrimination. But the court says you have to identify it with particularity. It's not enough to just point to racial statistics, even if they plausibly result from historic discrimination or what the Supreme Court calls societal discrimination, the discrimination that was pervasive throughout our society. That's not enough. To use racial classifications, you need to be more precise identify the time, manner, and actors involved as much as practicable to ensure that the use of race is limited to the extent necessary. And this would not be satisfied because the kinds of discrimination that black women experience in their life or which black Americans experienced in prior generations which are reflected today in economic disparities are undocumented. Uh, one simply cannot identify them with particularity. So strict scrutiny would uh, strike down response number two. So what about response, I'm sorry, response number one. What about response number two? Stress care for all women 
to reduce the racial gap in infant mortality. This is certainly more promising. Here, you're providing the benefit for, for white and black and other race, races. To understand how the court might approach this, understand this as what I call race-neutral affirmative action. And what I mean by that is it's, it's race-neutral in the policy it uses. It does not classify women by race. So it's race neutral, it asks just, are you a woman? Perhaps are you of childbearing years, or are you pregnant? But it still has an affirmative action purpose, it, by which I mean a purpose to benefit racial minorities. And let me explain why, because you might say, well, it's just designed to reduce the racial gap. It's not designed to uh, favor uh, black women. But logically, that's inherent in trying to reduce the racial gap. So to understand this, imagine reversing the races. So if you were designing it to or, or reverse the gap, to raise the gap, let's do something to increase the racial gap, that would probably uh, strike you as odd and troubling uh, and would be an, a, a means of benefiting white women more than black women. But more than to an intuition, logically, in order to reduce the racial gap, you have to reduce not just the numbers of black women, you have to reduce their percentages compared to the percentage of the rates for white women in order for the gap to go down. So it necessarily expects to reduce, intends to reduce, uh, the proportion of infant mortality among black women more than white women. So it has that affirmative action uh, intention. Well, the debate in the literature and in the courts is uncertain on this question. Do race-neutral classifications designed to benefit racial minorities trigger the strict scrutiny test? And it's uncertain. I weighed in on the debate early on, about 12 years ago, and I argued that the logic of current doctrine, doctrine would subject race-neutral policies that benefit racial minorities to strict scrutiny. Again, the intuition is, think of reversing the races. So imagine adopting a race-neutral policy to favor whites. So for example, if stress care were limited to married women, married, uh, married, white women are more likely to be married when they have children. And then assume that the purpose behind limiting the benefit to married women would be to favor white women, to disproportionately allocate the benefit to white women. Even though married black women would get the benefit, unmarried white women would not. If the purpose is to disproportionately benefit white women, and it would have that effect, then that would be understood as discriminatory uh, against African Americans. And in addition, again, to your intuition, we know the law would so hold. And we know this because of prior cases in which the Supreme Court has invalidated race-neutral classifications that were designed to favor whites over racial minorities. Literacy tests and poll taxes were struck down, even though they're race neutral, designed to burden African American access to voting. Or the University of Mississippi raised its SAT score cutoff for admission in order to favor admitting white applicants over black applicants. And the Supreme Court said, nice try, a race neutral classification designed to discriminate is still discrimination, and it has to uh, be subject to the strict scrutiny test. So that's one line of doctrine that just deals with laws that were designed to harm minorities. And then we have another line of cases that I've already mentioned involving express racial classifications designed to benefit minorities, the race-based affirmative action cases. And there the court says the Equal Protection Clause is symmetrical, it protects all races equally, at least for purposes of subjecting them to strict scrutiny. So racial classifications that benefit minorities uh, get that same test. So when you put these two lines together, race neutral classifications designed to harm minorities are subject to strict scrutiny. Express racial classifications designed to benefit uh, are subject to strict scrutiny. It logically follows then that Racial class, race neutral classifications designed to benefit racial minorities would be viewed as the, by the court as still discrimination, even though using race neutral means, and still discriminatory 
even though designed to benefit racial minorities. So that would result in subjecting number two to strict scrutiny as a form of race-neutral affirmative action. Now, I've also argued that race-neutral policies should satisfy strict scrutiny more often than express racial classifications. But strict scrutiny is strict by design, so one should always put their money on the law being struck down. And the court applying it would likely strike it down for the same reasons that it struck down number two. Even though you're benefiting all women, your goal is to disproportionately favor the benefit for African Americans. That's not necessary, nor have you identified the discrimination of the past with adequate particularity to satisfy that justification. So number two would probably be struck down, but the Supreme Court has yet to address that specific question, uh, so we'll just have to see. Which takes us to number three. Stress care for all women to reduce infant mortality, period. That seems unassailable. There's no race in the means, and there's no racial purpose. So what could be troubling about that? The problem is when you widen the time frame. Recall that the discovery of stress as a causal factor in contributing to infant mortality was an investigative process that began by inquiring into what's causing the racial gap in infant mortality. So there was a race-related motivation that began the process, and but for that race, racial motivation, we wouldn't have identified stress care and produced this policy. And some read the court as applying strict scrutiny whenever government decision-making is motivated by race. Policies that just have a racial effect are not subject to strict scrutiny, but if the policy was motivated by race, then it's subject to strict scrutiny. Other phrases are if it's because of race, if it was caused by race, or as some scholars have said, if it's race dependent, the decision-making process depended in some way on race. And under this conception, uh, response number three is also uh, based on race, because race motivated the initial inquiry, so it would be subject to strict scrutiny. And certainly a strict colorblind approach uh, could support striking this down, or at least subjecting it to strict scrutiny, because if government's really supposed to be colorblind, absent some extraordinary justification, then government wouldn't see racial disparities in order to investigate them. But here I want to argue that even under current law, response number three should be upheld. And this is by distinguishing between the discriminatory use of race and the evidentiary use of race. It's the discriminatory use of race that triggers strict scrutiny uh, when pursued through race-neutral means. And a more careful understanding of the discriminatory purpose is that it's when the policy was adopted with the purpose at the time of its adoption, concurrently. It was adopted with the purpose of affecting one racial group more than another. So recall the University of Mississippi raising its SAT score. It said, let's raise the score because of the, purpose, because of the effect it will have. That was part of the objective. That was part of the goal. And that's a discriminatory purpose, and I've already argued that I think that would likely apply even when the purpose is to benefit racial minorities, like in response number two. But the evidentiary use of race is a use of race at an earlier point in the decision-making process and with a different purpose. It's at the initial investigative stage, the fact-finding stage, and the purpose is informational in nature. It's to diagnose the underlying causes of the racial disparity. It's not about adopting a policy with a particular effect. It's about determining facts, understanding the causes. And that need not be followed by a discriminatory purpose. It could be if they then later purposely adopt a policy because of its effect on race, but it need not. 
that use of race precedes the adoption of the policy, precedes how the information discovered is used. But if the information discovered is non-racial in nature and used without regard to benefiting one racial group more than another, then there would be no discriminatory purpose to trigger the strict scrutiny test. So recall the miner's canary metaphor. The idea would be that the canary's distress is a signal to identify uh, underlying toxic uh, environment. But that signal is informational only. What you do with that signal is, is a different matter. So as applied to infant mortality, the idea would be the stage of investigating the causes is merely using race as an evidentiary signal into what might be going underneath, using race perhaps to determine what it's correlated with as a fact-finding uh, process. And support for this characterization can be seen in uh, the trial process, in legislative fact-finding, and in government agency research. In the trial process, race as evidence is routinely used without any suggestion that it should be subject to strict scrutiny. This is most evident in race discrimination cases. So if an employee sues an employer, the employee will produce evidence in most cases of the racial composition of the employer's workforce, of the racial effect of the employer's hiring policy, comparing the race and credentials of the employee with those of other people who were hired over him or her. And the other side will introduce racial evidence designed to dispel the allegation of race discrimination. Similarly, in, effort, in affirmative action cases, currently Abigail Fisher is suing the University of Texas, and part of her evidence is racial. She points to not only the use of race in the University of Texas's policy, but looks to how many people were benefited, Latinos and blacks, by the university's use of race, what the credentials of those particular people of those races are, and she also introduces the fact that she's Caucasian as part of her evidence. And the courts never suggested that that's uh, problematic. And in fact, Justice Scalia, who's one of the staunchest colorblind proponents on the court, has expressly characterized the proper use of race in employment discrimination cases as an evidentiary tool to determine whether the employer has discriminated against. He says the racial impact of a hiring pr uh, practice can properly be introduced as evidence of a discriminatory intent. His concern, though, is when the racial impact is used to establish as a matter of law that the employer discriminated. He says the employer should get to introduce other evidence including racial evidence, to dispel the inference that the statistics create. Uh, so he says it should be used as an evidentiary tool only. And then with legislative fact-finding and government agency research, uh, the political process widely accepts on both sides of the aisle uh, for forms of race in these processes. And the Supreme Court has, in, in cases where it's come across there, uh, bench, so to speak, has endorsed such uses of race. In affirmative action cases, for example, the court has expressly encouraged the use of racial statistics by legislatures who are trying to determine whether they uh, would be entitled to engage in affirmative action. And with respect to government agency research, the Supreme Court itself used racial statistics uh, in arriving at its own conclusion. In a case called United States versus Armstrong, black defendants were charged with crack distribution. And they claimed that the federal prosecutor's office for that jurisdiction was only prosecuting black defendants, even though they introduced statistical evidence to show that there were white defendants charged in state court in the same jurisdiction for crack distribution. So they said this prosecutor's office is discriminating by race. The trial court was actually sufficiently convinced uh, and in fact dismissed the prosecution. The Supreme Court reversed and reinstated the prosecution and they said this evidence does not prove the prosecutor discriminated. They did not fault the introduction of that racial evidence nor suggest it needed to satisfy strict scrutiny. 
They just said it wasn't sufficiently probative of a discriminatory purpose on the part of the prosecutor. And one of the evidence the court relied on was sentencing commission statistics about correlations between race and certain crimes. White people are more likely to do LSD and child pornography. Blacks are more likely to deal crack. And so they said, so the fact that there's a disproportionate impact on black defendants doesn't mean the prosecutor's doing the discriminating. It could be reflecting uh, real crime rates. So they use racial evidence as uh, their own evidence to arrive at their own conclusion. Before turning to my own conclusion, let me identify two corollaries to the evidentiary use of race that can help to clarify that this is not simply a clever means of engaging in race-neutral affirmative action. Some may think this is just a clever way of helping minorities uh, and, and coming up with a way of, of doing so. Well, uh, one way to clarify this is to give examples uh, that would show that this is not exclusively a way of benefiting racial minorities. Again, reverse the racial groups as a useful test for whether something is discriminatory or not. Recall with race-neutral affirmative action, I said if you re reverse the racial groups, race-neutral policies designed to favor whites seems discriminatory. Well, that's why I've argued that logically, when you try to favor blacks through race-neutral means it's discriminatory, uh, even though some uh, have disagreed with that interpretation. So if you reverse the groups here, would I still say it doesn't have to satisfy strict scrutiny? Well, I have to be committed to that, and it turns out I am. So, but here's how it goes. Let me give you the first corollary, which is disparities that burden whites can be investigated through the evidentiary use of race. And if that information is used for non-racial purposes, it's not subject to strict scrutiny. Here are two examples. Whites are more likely to commit suicide than blacks. Secondly, whites diagnosed with heart disease are less likely to get proper medical treatment than blacks diagnosed with heart disease. That's puzzling. Why would uh, either one be? Well, one hypothesis I've seen for suicide rates is that uh, black American culture tends to involve more external, uh, extended family uh, relationships and extended neighborhood relationships, including among the poor, as sociolo sociologists have uh, documented. And the hypothesis is that those interactions mean blacks are, on average, less likely to experience the kind of isolation that could contribute to suicide for someone experiencing uh, depression. With respect to heart disease, the hypothesis I've seen is that blacks are overall less healthy than whites. And so those who seek medical attention, and these are people who've been diagnosed with heart disease, Blacks are more likely to also seek medical attention for other uh, maladies. And so they're more likely to have their heart disease monitored and treated. Well, we've investigated the racial disparity. Here's non-racial information. It can be used for non-racial purposes, not for the purpose of benefiting whites, but for the purpose of benefiting anyone who might be susceptible to suicide or heart disease if uh, encouraging social support for people who might be suicidal or more frequent medical treatment for people diagnosed with heart disease. If that would benefit whites more than blacks, but that's not the purpose behind it, then it should not be subject to strict scrutiny, even though it was caused by investigating a racial disparity. The second corollary is disparities where that harm blacks, but where the underlying cause turns out to be useful. Uh, in ways that support leaving it in place. So consider that a law school, a public university, so it's subject to the Constitution, admits uh, a disproportionate number of whites among its applicants compared to black applicants. Inquire into the racial disparity. What's going on? What if it's determined 
as is quite plausible, that the law school admission test, the LSAT, has a disproportionate uh, effect against African American applicants, and so giving weight to the LSAT results in admitting fewer blacks. Well, is that a problem? Some people have argued that it is, and the LSAT is a flawed test. But if it's not flawed, and I don't have the expertise to say so, but my colleague Alex Johnson knows more about the LSAT than probably anyone in the country, he has argued that the LSAT itself is not the problem. That the law school admission test is actually a very well-designed test. It's probably one of the best high-stakes tests out there for any kind of educational uh, context. For its purpose, predicting first-year law school performance, it's actually a pretty good test. So if the test itself is genuinely useful for legitimate purposes, then the evidentiary use of race does not support eliminating it. So, well, the, you've, the underlying problem does not have a non-racial justification uh, for uh, eliminating uh, the cause. In fact, those who argue we should eliminate the LSAT because of its racial impact, they're the ones who might be subject to strict scrutiny. That might be a form of race-neutral affirmative action. You're eliminating the LSAT, which is a race-neutral policy change. But if it's for the purpose of increasing the admission of African Americans, that might be strict scrutiny as a form of race-based affirmative action. But if the non-racial reasons support keeping it, then the evidentiary use of race supports that result, even though the disparity burdens African Americans. So I began the legal puzzle with the question whether government, whether we, through our government, can investigate and address the causes of racial disparities, including in infant mortality, and this would apply to health more generally, and other factors like uh, economic or educational uh, disparities. I suggested that there are three potential uh, responses. The uh, going up the uh, screen, they become more problematic. The evidentiary use of race should be constitutional. Race-based affirmative action probably would be struck down. And race-based affirmative action, number one, would almost certainly be struck down. I want to conclude with the question whether we should. That is, whether we should, through our government, investigate and address the causes of racial disparities. And some may say no. And I don't just mean uh, bigots. Some people of good faith may just genuinely believe that racial inequality is simply an inevitable feature of American society. A colleague uh, and friend of mine who's a psychologist and a, a scholar studies the extent to which people are egalitarian minded, they believe that people are essentially equal, or hierarchically minded, that some people are better uh, than others. And she has found that some people are racially hierarchical, that they believe that on average uh, some races are uh, superior to others in their abilities. And in fact, her own college students have reflected this attitude. Some have said that they actually find it suspicious when they see blacks equally represented in positions of authority and power. That when there is proportional uh, representation of African Americans, that the the system must be rigged in some, in some way. And to some degree, who can blame them? These are young people who've grown up in a world without government-imposed segregation, and yet they see racial inequality all around them. They can peer in the window of their high school hallway when they were in high school, and if almost all the students are white or Asian, it's probably advanced placement. 
They can go down the hall and peek in another room, and if almost all the students are black or brown, it's probably a remedial level class or detention hall. So their experience teaches them that racial inequality is normal, even natural. My claim is the contrary, that racial inequality is neither normal nor natural. And I base my claim on the same proposition that the Supreme Court relies on when it subjects racial classifications to strict scrutiny, namely that race is irrelevant. If race is irrelevant, then racial inequalities suggest there's something amiss. If race is irrelevant, then black infants should not be more prone to die. Black children should not be more prone to fail out of school. Black adults should not be more prone to be poor, jobless, homeless, or serving time in prison. The fact that stark racial disparities persist across virtually every indicator of social and economic well-being signals, like the canary in the mine, that centuries of discrimination have entrenched inequalities that tend to perpetuate themselves from one generation to the next. And these inequalities mean unequal access to the types of resources and opportunities that are necessary for people to have fulfilling lives. If the Constitution is supposed to promote equality, then surely it doesn't mandate ignoring inequality. If anything, it should mandate addressing inequality. But at a minimum, it should permit the government to address inequality. The Constitution does not mandate ignoring the canary in the mine. The Constitution is not canary blind. Thank you very much.